what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Yuri Elkame and uh, his site and company is healthpreneurgroup.com, which we'll go deep on. Yuri, I always like to mention other guests that have been on Inspired Insider. And since you are, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know you don't love the term guru, but like a health expert, um, some of the other past guests, I had Wim Hof. Uh, on that's a really great episode. The Iceman, he's over 20 world records for cold exposure. Um, I think it was like a two hour interview. We had Dr. Lauren Cordain, author of The Paleo Diet. Maybe we'll talk about maybe the, some of the things that Yuri agrees with and maybe disagrees with with uh, Dr. Cordain's book. And uh, P90X founder Tony Horton uh, talks about how he started off as a street mine actually before they sold millions and millions of. P90X. And, you know, Yuri is a big fan of this is not easy. Building a business is not easy. And let's not pretend it's easy. And he made his food and rent money as a street mine before he made it, you know, which took years. Um, And Ben Greenfield, there's uh, some great videos of Yuri talking to Ben Greenfield actually out there. And uh, Ben talks about how he built a cult following in the health and fitness space. So that many more on inspiredinsider.com. And this is Episodes brought to you by Rise 25 at Rise 25. We help businesses give to and connect to your dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. You know, for me, Yuri, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that over the past decade than to profile the people and the companies I most admire on this planet and let them share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. Uh, if you have questions, go to rise25.com, email us. We're happy to answer anything that you can throw at us. I've been doing it for over a decade, and so is my business partner, John. So without further ado, uh, Yuri Elkame is a New York Times bestselling author, former professional athlete, business strategist, and founder and CEO of Healthpreneur, like I was mentioning. And you know his journey into health and business combined perfectly, unfortunately, because I know you're, you had a lot of health issues as a teenager and you lost all your hair at 17, uh, due to an autoimmune condition. And, you know, when you're in your teenage years, um, you know, a finger prick can seem like a big deal. And so when that happens, it can be traumatizing for someone who just wants to fit in and, you know, just be amongst the people. But he played professional soccer in his early 20s and that propelled him into health and fitness. And, you know, he carried that approach and built a successful online health empire. And I heard about Yuri years and years ago. Like I was watching some of your health videos because I geek out on health related stuff. Um, It must be over a decade ago. Um, And he had a following of over 500,000 people to better their health. He had a platform. He wrote best-selling books. He was on Dr. Oz and the doctors. In 2018, he actually sold that business and he runs Healthpreneur, uh, which is a world-class team of coaches helping health professionals in, and um, you know, kind of get to the high six and seven figure uh, with their virtual practices and create transformative results. Um, and listen, I experienced that as a chiropractor too. It's like if you're a naturopathic doctor, a chiropractor, if you are trading time for dollars and you just want to make a bigger impact, one-on-one with people is a great way, but one-to-many and the stuff that Yuri helps teach people can help you transform even more lives. So you can check out healthpreneurgroup.com. Yuri, thanks for joining me. Yeah, Jeremy, thanks for having me. You know, I was excited about this conversation because I geek out on health-related things and Health relates to business, right? And so talk about your philosophy on health when it relates to a business owner. And I do want to talk about mistakes that you see people making with their health. Yeah. Um, Number one, I think from a health perspective, we just all have to do what works best for us. I mean, I mean, I went through every possible dietary regime in my journey, like raw, paleo, the whole bit. And it wasn't that when it was, you know, this is the only way it's like, it was the way for me at the time. And then you just kind of find your way. So 
I think, you know, we just have to honor what feels best for us and what does best for our health. And I think um, it's challenging in a space where there's a lot of confusion because most people don't understand how their own body works. And so they don't understand how to make good decisions. So anyways, but I think when it comes to health and business, I don't understand, well, I shouldn't say this because I work a lot. I love working and I can work myself into the ground, not because I have to, but because I'm just like an obsessive monster with this stuff because I just love business. But I'm also very, very aware that nothing is more important than my health. And the reason for that is because, I don't know, I feel very blessed, honestly, because I lost my hair, as you said, when I was 17. It was a kick in the ass to be like, hey, man, you should pay attention to your health because I was active and fit growing up, but I wasn't healthy. And I didn't realize that until I went back to school like eight years later to pursue studies in nutrition and started to really uncover that my body was just like a, a polluted wasteland. So when I cleaned all that up and like I re regrew all my hair, uh, long story short, I fell out again about 10 years ago after a shot. But like it was it was a, like an eye opening experience for me to see like, whoa, hold on. Like the foods I eat can make a massive difference. Not only with my like my hair growth was like, to be honest, the last thing on my mind. I was more concerned about my lack of energy because for 28 years of my life, I was exhausted, like sleeping 12 hours a day. I thought I was just active, so I needed more sleep. But then I started cleaning up my diet and I was sleeping like six, seven hours a night and jumping out of bed. I was like, hold on. Whoa. And that was the, imp the impetus uh, from which I wrote my first book, which became a number two New York Times bestseller, The All Day Energy Diet. And I, I feel very fortunate to have had that experience to recognize how important good health is. Obviously, playing professional soccer, I went to school for kinesiology, having that background as well. Just like being active has always been part of my life. And it's like, I can't even imagine living a life that doesn't involve that. So for me, like a great day is five hours of exercise, like not like working out for five hours, but you know, on the, on the weekend, for instance, we took a, took the kids, went for an 11 kilometer walk. So it's about seven, eight miles. And, you know, we did a big walk, stopped at a place for lunch, walked back, came back, went for a swim. I mean, I don't want... I don't need anything else in my life other than just feeling good. And I really, I love my work. And if, if I'm doing like, obviously in the business, doing things that are doing a lot of good for a lot of other people. And at the same time in my own life, just sweating, feeling good. There's really nothing else that for me is more important. And I think, you know, obviously during the pandemic, I had two friends that passed away um, because they were unhealthy that. to begin with right? They were overweight, they smoked, they drank all the time. You know, and it's like, what's the point? Like you built this great business, you leave your family behind and all of that, nothing like from there to nothing. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs, maybe less so in the health space, but just in general, where they're just, they're overweight, they're, they're not healthy. And it's like, they're spending all their time living this entrepreneurial business life. And it's like, what's the point? They have unhealthy relationships, they're divorced. I'm like, what's the point of doing any of this stuff if, if that's the outcome? So mm. I don't know. I think for me, I think one of the most important constraints in any business is your own energy. If you're tired and lethargic and you can't focus, your business, it's going to hit ceilings pretty low. I want to dig deep and, you know, take me back to the time. And, and I want to, we will dig deep on some, you know, tangible health things that you recommend that you do. And, um, but taking back to the time, it's a scary thing. I mean, yes, you were losing your hair, but it's scary because you don't know what's causing it. Take me back to what was going through your head at that time. Well, less hair was going through my head. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, it was, it was, um, so I had long brown hair, like my dad's Moroccan. So there's like bushy eyebrows, all that stuff. And I was starting to notice like when I wash my hair, I'd notice like hair in my hands, I'm like what's going on? Hair in my pillow when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, huh? And then I started to notice like these uh, coin sized bald patches in my scalp. And essentially those alopecia after going to my immunologist and getting diagnosed with that. So I didn't really know what to make of it. I was like, what do I do? Their brilliant idea was let's just inject cortisone into your head for the foreseeable future. And that'll like somehow fix it. I'm like, you guys are crazy if you think that's happening. So I didn't really know what to make of it. I didn't know what to do. We, we, I mean, we went to every single practitioner you can think of. 
I remember going to a traditional Chinese medicine doctor and he had this like weird concoction bark like soup that I was drinking on a daily basis. I mean, it was just nice to just try different things, but nothing really solved the issue. But a lot of people like to your point, you know, they say that must have been really hard going through, you know, your teenage years, senior year of high school. To be honest, I don't think it was that bad. And then maybe I'm just covering this up. Who knows? I don't remember. I, I didn't I didn't sink into a depression. We'll put it that way. I was sure I was it was awkward seeing people look at me like I'm going through chemo that that those kind of looks down the hall and stuff in school. But outside of that, I've never been one to ever give a shit, to be honest, about what other people think about me. And that's not quite true. I mean, I think to some degree, like I still care, but to be honest, I'm not, I don't care about fitting in. I never had like that traditional, like cool group in high school. I was just like, whatever it is, what it is. And I think I had the perspective at the time where I was like, it's only hair. It could be worse, right? Like people are dying of other things. And I like, I'm losing my hair. It's not a big deal. So I think I had that maybe maturity for the lack of a better word at an early age, which helped me navigate that. But it was also a real kind of kick in the butt to be like, Maybe you should figure out why this happened, because we know with autoimmunity, it's like it's not just that one thing; it can lead to other things. And I didn't know this at the time, obviously, but it, it was a real big eye opener to be like, maybe you should look at why this happened. And that was really where it opened Panda, Pandora's door over the next couple of years to to start, you know, going down the rabbit hole there. Yeah, I mean, you went on a personal health journey, you know, for yourself. Um, you mentioned the all day energy diet book where where yeah. can people find that bookstores amazon okay. all the typical places yeah i love to hear some of the resource other resources you like and looked at and, and maybe other health mentors that you talked to over the years that have helped as well yeah i mean like in terms of like other health experts there's so many i mean you mentioned ben greenfield he's a good buddy of mine we've had some fun experiences together and i've always like you know, whether it's him or Dave Asprey or or anyone else, like there's like there's all these little nuggets that I've you know I've gleaned from them. Um, you know, some things we don't necessarily agree on, and that's not the point. It's like there's certain things that people do where it's like, huh, that's interesting. Let me try that. Like when I first learned about Wim Hof, I'd never really had done cold plunges, and now I can't live without them. I mean, I, that's that's kind of an exaggeration. I can obviously, but I feel amazing with them, right? So it's all these little like things that you pick up along the way. But I think for me early on, the big, the, the big transformation was I just didn't know anything about nutrition. Like I thought eating, I, when I was playing soccer in France, I would get a whole baguette every day and like two chocolate croissants. And I thought that was just normal. Like, ah, like I'm meal of champions. Yeah. Breakfast of champions. Totally. And then, I, and then I started learning about nutrition when I, when I retired and came back to school and I was like, what? Really? And then I started to experience eating more plant-based foods. I went raw for a whole four months and I felt like I was on cloud nine. And that became the foundation of a lot of my, my nutritional philosophy at the time, which was eat more plants, eat more plant-based foods, more of them in their raw states without being fanatical about it, alkalize the body, reduce inflammation. Cause I, I had done all that stuff. And like literally in two months applying those principles, I regrew all my hair. And more importantly, is like, I felt like I was on cocaine, not that I've ever done cocaine, but it was just like nonstop energy. It wasn't the highs and lows that you get with like caffeine and stuff. It was just sustained. I got to go to, I got to go to bed now. Like I, I want to stay up. It was just incredible. And that, that really formed the foundation. And then I started looking into, I've always been fascinated by our body hasn't evolved at all. Like for, since we've, you know, been on this planet. So what did our ancestors do that we're no longer doing? You know, intermittent fasting became a big piece of, of, of what I wrote about and taught, and I still apply it. You know, 20,000 years ago, there was no Starbucks at every corner, right? There was no refrigeration. So our, our ancestors went through periods of feasting, fasting. Um, and to think that that's not normal now is weird because it, there's so much garbage in terms of you know, information out there, like, you know, get into the starvation mode. If you don't eat every couple hours, you're going to kill your metabolism. I'm like, what? That doesn't make, it just like didn't intuitively make sense to me. But the challenge is that, that there's science to support both sides. 
And that's the, 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 the never ending challenge and opportunity really in health is you can find science to support any position. So we know from a marketing perspective, like when you write a book, I remember having these conversations with my publishers, what's the angle, what's the hook, right? We've heard that before. How can we make it different? And like, it's marketing and that's, it's great to know that, but at the same time, it's also very, very confusing for the average consumer when most of the information is kind of the same or it's completely different just to be polarizing. And it's hard. And that's why I said, like, you have to experiment with stuff. Understand that you may not be attached to that for the rest of your life, but figure something out that feels good for you, that makes sense for you, and that's sustainable. Because if you can't do it for life, don't do it for a day. That's you know, that's my philosophy in general. So I'd love to hear your musts health wise, like yeah. whether it's okay. Yes, I do. I know you, you know, I've heard you say you do cold plunges early in the morning. Um, intermittent fasting is a must. What are the musts throughout the day? And also, I love to hear when you talk to Ben Greenfield, what are the musts that you agree on? And maybe we'll talk about what things you debate a little bit. Yeah. Um, but what are your musts for health? Yeah, so we moved houses about a year ago. And before that, I actually had converted my garage into a gym. In that gym, I turned a chest freezer into a cold plunge, which was amazing. Like, and when we moved, I didn't have the, the same setup to make it work. So we turned that chest freezer back into a chest freezer. And that's the one thing that during that period of time, every single morning at 4 a.m., it was like first thing, like right in there. And so do I you fill myself, the chest one, freezer with water? Like just for people who don't know what they like, yeah. paint a picture yeah. what that looks like. I know I, I take it like everyone understands what I'm talking about. <laughs> so imagine a chest freezer, but there's nothing in it other than water. And there's a certain way of setting this up so it doesn't obviously drift through the seams and it has to be filtered properly, et cetera. So I'd be jumping into water. No, I shouldn't say jumping in, like stepping into water that was celsius four degrees so whatever that is fahrenheit i don't even know but it was like there, there was moments where you know there'd be a little bit of ice floating around from you know sitting there overnight i'd sit in there for three to four minutes and i'd use that as like the toughest thing i'm going to do today is this and it was very uncomfortable at four in the morning especially like in the winter when it's cold outside but i would get in there and i would just like focus on the wall and i would just breathe for four minutes and it was my version of meditation which i found very very effective i found it helped me zen out and just handle um, different situations with a bit more tranquility, if you will. Because when you get into cold water, initially it's like fight or flight, like holy, sh and then it's like you calm down. And it's very applicable to so many aspects of life. I've got four boys. There's many occasions like that. So it's like, what the chill, calm down. So it was a really good practice for me. And it's something I still uh, do my best to be mindful of, although I don't have the cold plunge anymore. I do a cold, a cold bath where I'll just get a bunch of ice and throw it in about three, four times a week. I find it makes a huge difference for me. Um, I also had a bit of back pain at the time from doing some deadlifts and I was seeing a chiropractor and I love chiros. So I, some of my best friends are chiros and I love the profession, but it really wasn't, you know, really solving the issue for after a couple of weeks. And after one week of doing cold plunges for the first time, it was gone forever. And that was when I was like, holy goodness. So that was for me, um, at that time, and still to this to this uh, to this day, something really really important that I try to do my best of to replicate because I also believe that we need to stress the body, right? So and it's like we become more resilient to our environments and other things. So that was one form of it. Second thing I'd say really quickly, you I have a question on that. Did you work up? Uh, in other words, did you go? Oh, I'm going to do cold showers for a while, and then go. Listen, I'm just this is amazing. And, or did you go straight to the, I would say, you know, extreme of just getting a full chest yeah. and, and doing a, a dip in that every day? Yeah. I think it started, it started with the cold showers, but they just annoyed me because I'm like, <laughs> I want to get my legs, but only my shoulders are getting the water right now. Right. And that's just, I'm like, this is annoying. <laughs> so it started with the cold showers and then it went to the cold plunge. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, just for people at home, like, you know, you could, you don't have to get like a chest. You can, you could start off slower, you know, yeah. and, and test it out, uh, on a smaller level, I guess you could say. Yeah. hundred percent. So what's the, the second, second, say the second must for me would just be daily movements. I'm a big believer. Like I love, I love spending time outdoors. 
So walking, I don't run too much. I don't bike too often because I don't like feeling like I'm going against the wind all the time, which I end up feeling like on a bike. But I just like being outdoors. So usually for me, it's walking by the water and nature. Um, I, I really, really enjoy doing that. That's for me on a daily basis, minimum, minimum like an hour typically. And then outside of that, I just lift heavy things. So I'm not one to lift like five pound dumbbells. I'm like, let me, I'll throw a 40 pound weighted vest on. I'll go for a six mile hike slash run. And I'll like really stress my body, but I don't do that every day of the week. I'll do that once a week. And then I'm like, my body is pretty toast. I'm going to give myself two, three days off. So I, I train when I train, like I'm lifting heavy relative for me because it's just, we know that strength is such an important indicator of longevity and quality of life as we get older. Plus it just feels really good to be strong. So whether it's squats, deadlifts, pull-ups, I'll typically do a lot of body weight stuff now with a 40 pound weighted vest on just because I get bored of doing like 75 push-ups. I'm like, let me just do like 20, but really get challenged. A 40 um, I, pound I weighted vest is pretty hardcore. Yeah, totally. Like Rogue, I get all my, I, I get all my stuff from Rogue. So they have the best fitness stuff. I'm just like, cool, 40 pound weighted vest. Let's just do it. And then I'll just do core work, like planks, side planks, push-ups, pull-ups, dips with the weighted vest on. And I like a lot of variety in my workouts. So at least for now, it's, it's what I enjoy. But I like to lift heavy things because number one, it creates the best stimulus for the muscles. I don't have to work out as often. Um, again, I would rather be outside than in the gym. So if I'm in the gym, it's like, I'm going to lift heavy for like 30, 45 minutes. And then I have to, I have to take a couple of days off because my muscles are crushed. So it's nice just from a time-saving perspective, as much as I enjoy working out, I'd much rather be outside playing soccer or, you know, going for a walk in the woods, but I can't just do that because you got to keep your body strong. I like to start my days now. Uh, not every day, but most mornings with a swim. I, I, I'm, an, I'm not a great swimmer, but it's something that I have said, okay, I'm going to work on this. And I like moving my body first thing in the morning. So when it's nice outside, like i.e. not minus 10 degrees and the pool's open, I'll typically swim just to get movement going. And then um, that's just a nice way for me to start the day because I don't often feel like going for a walk first thing in the morning. Again, for me, it's just a lot of variety. So some days I go for a walk by the water. Sometimes I go for a swim in the morning. But movements, just like getting getting moving is important. From a diet perspective, eating. Yeah, so um, it's actually, this is hilarious because in my book, The All Day Energy Diet, I demonize coffee and now I love it. So th I'm just being real. Like, like this is, you know, I wrote the book. Well, tell me about that. What, yeah. what changed? What, were you, what was your thought that time and what's your thoughts now? Yeah, so I never drank coffee until I moved to Europe when I was playing soccer there. And then I was introduced because, you know, my teammates were European and we'd sit in a cafe and they're like, Hey, so anyways, that's where it started. I didn't get heavily into it, but I did feel the effects like the jitters when I had caffeine. And I'm like, I don't like this feeling. And I remember playing a game where I had an espresso before the game. And I was a mess in the game, like just like not good. And so that was my first, like, Oh, this is, you know, maybe not that great. So I wrote a lot about because I, I had I had experienced the difference of sustained energy and the jitters and crashes. And I'm like, I like sustained energy. And I don't know what changed. I mean, maybe it's just over time, I like the it's it's almost like the romance of having a coffee. Like I I like to think that I'm a European living in Canada. And I don't drink big coffees. I mean, like this is the size of the cup I drank. So it's like a a lungo, I guess. But I just, I like the, I'll wake up in the morning, I'll do my stuff, and then I'll typically have one of these, maybe two. I'm at a point now where I've had enough coffee where I don't get the jitters, so maybe that's not a great thing. But for me, a big piece of, of my day-to-day -day existence is just doing things that bring joy to my life. And I And this is weird. I go to bed at night, and I'm like, I cannot wait to have this in the morning. And maybe that's like, you could say, hey, you're a man. I think you're like addicted or something. And, and maybe that's true. <laughs> yeah. But I get a lot of joy out of small things like that. But at the same time, I balance that. I balance that out with a lot of greens, a lot of green juices, a lot of alkalinity. And I understand like I can have two, three, I start feeling like crap, crap afterwards. 
So first thing in the morning, typically for me is, is one or maybe two of these. I typically do not eat. Like I haven't had any food today yet. Um, if I do have any food before one o'clock, it's typically a protein shake. So it's like literally like protein powder with water. I don't even blend anything in the, in the Vitamix. For me, it's like nothing early in the day, pretty much. Mid-afternoon, late afternoon, I start getting a bit hungry. So we usually have a bigger dinner, um, but I might have something around lunch. And then dinner for us is like early bird special with the kids, 4.35 o'clock. And at that point, it's, you know, fish, steak, lots of salads, vegetables. You know, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's, it's not a vegetarian or vegan diet, nor is it paleo. It's just whole food based for the most part. And, you know, it's pretty simple. So, you know, we have our staples. Once a week, I treat myself to a little Cinnabon or a croissant, you know, little things like that. Um, but yeah, so it's pretty simple. So typically on a daily basis, you're you're sort of practicing intermittent fasting in a sense, right? Because you're not eating maybe until one or something like that each day. Yeah, I'd say it's not as maybe as consistent as like a 16, eight, seven days a week, nor do I do a 24 hour fast that often anymore. It's more of, am I really hungry or am I just, am I bored? Like, I'm just going to set the intention of like, I don't really have to have food. Because even I went through a phase where I'd have like a smoothie first thing in the morning. And I just felt like a zombie afterwards. You know, like, like even if it was a healthy smoothie, blueberries, strawberries, a banana, veggies. I'm just like vegetable after that. So I'm like, I don't even need anything in the morning. If I'm going to have that, I'll work out first, open up my cells to be more receptive to that. And then I'll make that kind of smoothie a bit later. But I would say on average, most days, um, again, if I go to bed, I don't typically eat after eight o'clock at night. I'm usually in bed by 930. So call it nine until nine the next morning is 12. So minimum on most days for me is like 15 to 16 hours in a fasted state. Here, if someone's thinking, they go, I've heard this intermittent fasting thing. I'm thinking about it. What would you tell them? Just try it. Yeah. So my second book, The All-Day Fat-Burning Diet, uh, one of the days, it was basically uh, based on a kind of primitive caloric cycling type of, type of process. One of those days was a 24-hour fast. And one of the biggest things I realized from everyone doing it was they started to report how they started to recognize the relationship with food. It's like, they, they got to a point where they went through a little bit of a panic and this could be 12, 14, 16, 18 hours in. And they're like, hold on, why? Like, I'm going to be okay. I'm not going to die if I don't eat for one day. Why am I hungry at this time? Am I, am I anxious? Am I stressed? Am I bored? Am I eating because I'm used to eating at this point? And most people, myself included, back in the day, do not realize what true hunger feels like. And I think it's important to get to that level so you recognize everything's okay. You're going to be just fine. And when you learn the science behind it, it just makes a lot of sense from a health perspective. But I would say doing a fast, I would say like do a, a legit 24-hour fast for no other reason than to experience that. Because you're going to see like this thing kick in, your head, your mind is going to be like, you can't do this, dude. You got to eat some food. You're going to pass away. Just go through that experience. And then on a flip side of it, now you'll be in control to be like, I'm going to be okay. Right. I'm not going to die. Everything's going to be fine. And actually I feel more mentally clear. I can focus better. So you start to see these benefits that most of us are scared of experiencing because we're like, Oh my God, I have to eat. So I think for anyone listening, uh, just try it. And again, I understand that certain people, you know, there's, there's hormonal things to consider whether fasting is the best for everyone. I don't, I don't know. But I think regardless of your situation, just try it once. You'll be fine. And you'll, you'll learn a lot about yourself in the process. In your diet, you're, and I know, like you said, there's factors where you should definitely not do that. Like if you're diabetic and you actually have videos about specific things uh, for diabetics. Uh, but let's assume you're not diabetic. You're fine. You're going to survive and you're okay. What would be the ideal scenario maybe for you of how often should you do a 24-hour fast? Yeah, again, like it depends. I think you have to consider, you know, your lifestyle a little bit. 
I think it's actually easier for someone who's busy working in like a hospital, for instance, compared to me working at home where the kitchen's over there. So I can just like go eat whenever I want. It's challenging to be like, hold on, you're fasting, relax. If you're busy out of the house, it's actually sometimes a bit easier. So if you're really busy at work, use one of those days as, hey, I'm just going to fast today. Because then you don't have to think about what I'm going to have for lunch, what I'm going to have for dinner, what am I like? All these questions that take up so me- so much mental energy. So I would say, and again, there's different ways of fasting. There's 16, 8, so 16 hours fasting, 8-hour window of eating. Um, I talk about a 24-hour full-day fast. So I would say experiment with both of those and see what makes the most sense for you. I Again, personally, I don't do a 24-hour fast. It's been a while since I've done one. Maybe I, I just, I don't see the need to be honest. And for me, I, I find 16, eight consistently is a, l- a little bit easier. But I would say, honestly, probably once a week. Once a week, there's a tremendous amount of benefits to not eating. And if you experience that once a week, there's a lot of like, just from a fat loss perspective, you know, inflammation perspective, et cetera. Um, I think once a week is, is a nice ballpark to, to shoot for. I'm curious, uh, you're, you know, I know you are a big promoter of eating whole foods, you know, there's nothing that replaces fruits, vegetables, you know, healthy meats, fish. I'm wondering from a supplement perspective, I don't know um, <clears throat> what you would recommend, maybe you've taken or maybe that you're, uh, you've talked to Ben Greenfield about what, if someone, I don't want to use the term lazy, but, you know, supplement their their diet what yeah. supplements do you recommend i mean you don't have to say brands but just in you know sure types of supplements well, yeah i mean i think it's very very individual based on what their needs are so um yeah it definitely helps if you do some kind of blood panels to, to see where you are deficient because that's a good starting point and so for me i did a blood panel Earlier this summer, I was very high in vitamin D. I was like, cool, I'm going to take the summer off from that. And that's good to know. I wouldn't have known that otherwise. I was taking like 10,000 IUs a day for months. So that's good to know. Otherwise, you could just, you know, not do, you could do some damage if in certain cases. I'll, I'll just share like what I do. Again, I'm, it's tough to make recommendations for everyone. So for me on a daily basis, it's a DHA. So in the form of an algae oil, typically, like I don't, we don't have fish oil that much anymore. So it's an algae oil, uh, DHA, big focus in terms of reducing inflammation, improving cardiovascular function, reducing LDL, all that good stuff. Um, second thing typically right now is quercetin. Uh, that's because I've got asthma. And, and for some weird reason over the past, since we moved actually, because we're a lot more in nature now, I've noticed my asthma during pollen season is a lot worse. And it's, partly related to histamine, quercetin is awesome at, it's kind of like a natural natural reactant, more or less, right? It's just incredibly effective. So I'd take that on a daily basis. Um, the other thing I've been doing the last couple of months is desiccated beef organs, uh, which for me, it was never something I considered. I mean, I did bone broth, a lot of that, but now I'm like desiccated liver, heart, spleen, um, I've noticed a really pretty significant difference in terms of energy, uh, vi- uh, virility, if that's the word, um, male prowess, if we'll consider it that way. So there's been some really cool benefits on that pers- on that side of things. Yeah, I remember in in chiropractic school, there'd be some companies and uh, people aren't familiar with it. I know there's a bunch of companies that probably do it at that time. I don't know if they're big anymore, but standard process was big in mm-hmm. having capsules of like desiccate. It sounds weird for if you've never heard of this before, but yeah, desiccated organs of like you're like you're talking about in a in a capsule. Yeah. Other than that, um, liposomal vitamin C. That's about it. And uh, winter time, more vitamin D. Uh, but that's that's pretty much all I take. And then obviously I have a greens powder that I don't even use that much anymore, to be honest, because I'm too uh I've I've almost taken it too much because I I developed it many, many years ago. So it's like I've almost used my own stuff too much that I have to have more variety. So supplement wise, that's pretty much it. Uh, in terms of like food supplement, it'll be maybe a greens powder and water. Typically it's gonna be like fresh pressed green juices instead. And 
just like protein, like a good quality protein with water after a workout or even, you know, during the day just to get my protein up. That's pretty much what it. type of protein. And I know it's individual, but for you, is there certain um, grams of protein you like to get a day and, and what type of protein do you like to take? I'm not, I don't like whey protein. I don't, I don't like the fact that it, well, it, it kind of upsets my stomach a bit. So that's one. Um, so I, I typically don't do that. I'll use a pea protein isolate, which basically has the same amino acid profile as whey. Um, for me, I'll take in anyone serving about 20 grams. So if it's one shaker, it's about 20 grams. I'll do definitely one shaker, maybe two a day. And yeah, I, I, I don't count my stuff. So I don't know if it's hundred grams of protein I'm getting a day or 85. So got it. From the business perspective, you know, we talked about, obviously, if you don't have your health, it's hard to be as effective as you can be. What are some of the, and you help a lot of different businesses. Um, what do you see as far as mistakes in business that people are making? I'll say like one of the biggest ones, this is more on the health professional side because so many health professionals are busy, burnt out. They're dealing with patients and clients all day long. And they say they want to keep doing that instead of the marketing. So what they do is they end up outsourcing the most important part of their business, which is marketing to an agency, some VA, to someone who doesn't understand their messaging, and then they're screwed. Number one, they haven't built the skill set. Number two, if that person leaves, they're left with nothing because they don't have the skill set to learn how to put their stuff out there. So I think that's a big, big, big issue. And I think that it's really just like a mindset because for me, marketing is teaching. That's it's just sharing content over and over and over again a million times to to like you know, you're bleeding out the years. And it just takes time. Like people are not going to see your stuff initially. And the more you do it, the easier selling becomes or the easier buying stuff from you becomes because people have seen your stuff forever. So if you like teaching and sharing content, that's marketing. That's not stuff you can really outsource. And I'm not saying you should never have a marketing team eventually as your business grows for sure. But I would, I would venture to encourage everyone to build out all of that internally because we've, we've done both. We've worked with agencies to run our Facebook ads. Um, you know, recently we, so we did that for five years. I ran all of our Facebook ads myself. So I built the skill set when we started Healthpreneur, built it to seven figures. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to have, a, I'm going to have someone else do this. So over the past five years, we worked with three very well-known expensive agencies and things were things were good and then um less so and then i just got really upset earlier this year and i was like you know this is ridiculous i feel like we're spending a lot and there's a lot of room on the table here to, to improve things so i just said we're going to bring everything back in house so i ran the ads myself again earlier this year and in the process kind of updated our internal sops and we dropped our cost per acquisition by 60%. We tripled our ad spend in 45 days. And I was like, holy shit, like, what have we been missing out on for the past five years? And I, and I was just like, this is crazy. And so anyways, trained up one of our team members to run the ads internally now for us. But it was a good process because it was a good reminder of, number one, if you don't have the skill set, you will always be at the mercy of other people who do. And a lot of times, they're not as good as you think they are. And even if they are, they don't care about your business as much as you do. And when it comes to working with agencies, although there's some great people running those, the reality is like fractional attention leads to fractional results. And I just wasn't okay with that. And so I just got to the point where I was just like pissed. I'm like, you know what? I'm bringing this stuff in house. And I think a lot of health professionals are doing this stuff way too early in their business. Like, they're not even making, they're not even generating revenue and they want to outsource their marketing. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you have to learn this stuff. I would say it's probably the fundamental, most uh, common mistake I see. And it's also why a lot of them struggle in business because they don't understand how to market. They don't understand how to position themselves. And they think that someone else is going to do that for them. Yuri, who's ideal for you when we talk about healthpreneur? I'm um, health, you know, healthpreneurgroup.com. People can check it out. Who's an ideal fit for, for that business? It's really any health professional who has ECD. So what I mean by that is expertise, confidence, and drive. We, we work with health professionals to grow their coaching businesses or virtual practices. So online, not brick and mortar. And 
there's a certain element of, I don't know what, what that's going to look like. I don't know if I can do that. Or I believe in myself. I know I can figure it out with the right support. So for the person who has expertise, like they didn't just get certified last weekend or they didn't just graduate last weekend, they've worked with paying clients, they know they can solve a problem and they believe in themselves to the extent that even if they don't have the answers, they believe that they can figure things out with the right support. For us, whether they're a chiropractor, naturopath, dietitian, nutritionist, health coach, trainer, it doesn't matter because we've helped all of them. But it's funny because on our application page, we say we don't work with massage therapists, yoga therapists, uh, those selling MLM or low price membership sites. And there's a very specific reason for that. And someone was asking me in our Facebook group, like our non-client Facebook group, he's like, why don't you work with massage therapists and, and yoga uh, people? And I said, no offense to them because they're amazing. But after doing this for a very long time and speaking with thousands of people, I can tell you with a very high degree of certainty that those two professions generally have a very small vision for their business and don't believe they can help people virtually. So why would I entertain those conversations? Like if someone, listen, we have massage therapists that are clients as well, but generally 98% of them are like, I don't, I don't see how I can do this online. I'm like, well, I'm not going to try to convince you that you can versus a chiropractor who's like, well, how am I supposed to adjust people over Zoom? I'm like, you're not supposed to, but you have years and years of knowledge and protocols that you can guide someone through without you being hands-on. I'm just asking you to be open-minded to that possibility. And there are chiropractors who are, who crush it. And there are others who aren't, who continue being crushed in their clinic 14 hours a day. So for me, it's like understanding number one, We've been waving the virtual flag since 2016. The pandemic hit and everyone came online. They're like, I've been thinking about this, but now I have to do this. And there was a big surge. And the, the market fundamentally shifted where virtual care was more accepted by patients and clients and also more accepted by professionals because they're like, oh, I could do this and I don't have to leave my house. And my clients are often getting better results because they're taking more ownership of their own healing journey, as opposed to laying on a table and getting stuff done to them. And all of a sudden now, it's it's really just, it's a, it's a bit of a paradigm shift. There's still a lot of resistance, I would say on the practitioner side, like because now things are kind of somewhat back to normal. So they're back in the clinic and burning out. But I'd say those are the, so being open-minded and having ECD, expertise, confidence, and drive are the most important determinants. Everything else, on the client acquisition, delivering results online, that's easy for us, right? If someone has the chops, we can help them do all that stuff. I'd love to hear of how Healthpreneur works. Yuri, talk about Dr. Ryan. Yeah, so in a nutshell, we have our main program called the Health Business Accelerator. It's essentially helping solve the acquisition problem of clients. Like no one knows who you are online. No one's walking by your clinic online and walking in that the brick and mortar world does not exist online. So you have to proactively market yourself. We do that with paid traffic. So we don't do dancing videos on TikTok and Instagram. We're like, no, no, let's build a real business built on systems that works for you. So the two systems we help our clients build are on the acquisition side and on delivery. So away from one-on-one -on -one to one-to-many producing better results. So Ryan came to us uh, end of 2019 a uh, team of six chiropractic clinic on the verge of bankruptcy. They took out a $40,000 loan to stay afloat, comes across our stuff. He's like, I got to do this. And within three months, so this is starting getting into March, 2020. So just when COVID hit, they went from negative 40,000 to doing $358,000 per month. And then that summer, they had hit $1 million per month. Two years later, they were close to 5 million a month. They now have built the largest thyroid coaching program on the planet, enrolling about 1,000 clients a month, $7,000 each on average. And it's funny because people are like, oh, they're scamming people. They're taking advantage of people. There's no way they can produce results. I'm like, okay, you're right, based on what you know, right? But could it be possible that they're producing incredible results just in a way that you're not even familiar with yet? So that's what's possible, right? And obviously they're a unicorn. Not every one of our clients get those types of results. Um, but we have another client. Uh, Before we go to the ago. next client, Yuri, talk about, so from a little bit of going the weeds with me here for a second. Yeah. So they come in, 
uh, he comes in and um, what are some of the steps you take him through to get from, okay, we're negative 40 um, to scaling it up? So all of our clients, we teach them the same business model. It's called a perfect client pipeline on the acquisition side. So it's a four-step business model. It's a Facebook ad or a traffic source into a webinar. From the webinar, it's leading people to an application to speak with you. And then you've got a phone conversation. So like a discovery call, right? We didn't invent that, but we've perfected it. So our, our clients have generated more than $217 million with that process. We only work with health experts. And what's funny is some people are like, yeah, like I've got a bunch of that stuff in place. I'm like, great. Why are you making less than 5,000 a month? You don't have anything in place. Because if you did, you'd be crushing it and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be speaking. There's a very big difference between driving a broken down 1980 Honda Civic, which is a car, and a Ferrari, which is also a car. And what we help our clients do is do things properly. So they're driving a friggin' Ferrari instead of a broken down 1980 Honda Civic. So there's so many little nuances in terms of the messaging, the positioning, the offer, how to speak with people on the phone to enroll them. Yeah, if one thing is off, it does, the whole thing doesn't work. Exactly. And amateurs don't see that. Amateurs believe like, oh, I've done a webinar before. I'm like, great. Where are the results? Because if you don't have the results, you're missing something that you're not even aware of. And that's the biggest danger in every business is our blind spots. You don't know what you don't know, which is why people hire coaches and ideally people who've been there and done this many times like we have. We didn't just have like a good month. I've been in business online since 2005. Okay, I've made a lot of mistakes, had a lot of wins. And obviously we've helped a lot of people. So, you know, we're the best at what we do. And we expect people coming in to work with us to be the best at what they do. Because in no way, shape or form, Form. If we help them amplify their, their marketing, like that's what we're doing, more people are just going to know that they suck, right? So they have to be good at what they do. So the beautiful thing about our process is I would say 90% of our clients come in with no following, no website, nothing. And we can help them go from that to six figures in a couple months because of the power of paid traffic. If you don't have a following on Instagram and you start today, You'll spend the next three to five years to maybe get to 10,000 people. And that's daily that's posting. It's a big maybe. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a big maybe. With Facebook ads, you could press publish on your Facebook ads and you could be doing $10,000 a month or $10,000 next week based on your ad spend and what your metrics look like. You could do more, you could do less. So what we're helping our clients do is by speed, by leverage and systems, so you're not grinding away on social media. And if you have a social media account, our clients come in with that. They're making like, you know, we've got some clients, the first week they work with us, they're making $40,000 because we show them how to communicate with their followers to turn more of them into paying clients even before their pipeline's built. So if you have assets, you'll just go crazy very quickly. If you don't, it's gonna take a little bit longer, but you're gonna have to put in the work anyways. Let's build the system that works for you and then you don't have to work as hard in the future. Yeah. I want to talk about um, branding a second, but really quickly, the offer. The offer mm -hmm. is huge. With Dr. Ryan, did he? Did you help him figure out, oh, thyroid's my niche? Or did he come in and go, this is what I'm best at? Yeah, there was a bit of, uh, they, had a, they had a functional medicine designation. So they had done some functional medicine stuff. And they had, let's see, more success in Hashimoto's. So that's what they focused on. And that's a big piece of what we do with our clients. Like right away, who's your perfect client? What's the big problem you're solving? That's the like, that's where most people go wrong. Like you choose the wrong market, the wrong problem to go after, nothing else you do is going to make sense. If you really identify that problem that people need to solve, and then you put an offer in front of them in such a way that it's it's unique, it's different, it's better. Yeah, that's 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 really like three quarters of the battle for sure. And what happened with with Dr. Brandy? So Brandy was a naturopath, uh, 60 hours a week in her clinic, burnt out like most health professionals are. She took a year off. She like literally like left the clinic, took a year off. She kept seeing our ads on Facebook for like a year. And then eventually she's like, I'm going to do this. And she did. And her second second month of that, she made $27,000. And the most important thing about that and then she's you know maintained that level since. 
The most important thing about that is not the money. It's about when she was in her clinic, she barely saw her son. And her son was three at the time. And she wanted more freedom. She wanted more time with her son. You know, now she's able to, they took a full year RV trip. So she was working from her RV and spending a lot more time with her son and family. And that was a big driver for her was just to have that freedom and location independence, which you don't have if you have a clinic. But again, she had confidence. She knew she was good at what she did. And she had a big vision. She had drive. If someone's got a very small vision, the number of bumps you're going to run into in the road is going to derail you. If you just want to cover the bills, that's not a big enough why. You will get punched in the face so often running your business like this that you have to have drive and, and, and a vision to keep getting up because a lot of health professionals succeed in spite of themselves in a clinic where people walk down the street and just fall into their lap. But that doesn't happen online. And you have to be realistic about that. And you have to be willing to roll up your sleeves, deal with the punches, get back up, and just keep going. Yuri, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out healthpreneurgroup.com. Check out one of his books, All Day Energy Diet, All Day uh, or All Day Fat. What is it? The All, all Day, day fat, fat Burning Diet. All Day Fat Burning Diet. Um, but check it out. And uh, Yuri, I really appreciate your stories and your expertise. Thank you Thanks, so much. Man. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.